Good evening, everyone. Uh, before we get started, um, Katie, I have a question. Um, it looks like uh, some of the commissioners um, might be having difficulty getting here on this time frame. Uh, can we move forward if we have a quorum of council, but not a quorum of the commission? Uh, Katie, we're having audio. This is Alexis. Is everyone else unable to hear Katie? Yes, yes I was. You're not here. Yeah, Katie, it's, it's very muffled. We can't hear you. Or see you. Can you see me now? Much better. And Excellent. And you can hear. Oh, very good. All right. Well, that took care of everything. Um, it looks like we have two commissioners on the line. Do we have a third that could be promoted from an attendee status? It does not look like it. So as this is a workshop, the two commissioners can simply attend the meeting of the city council in this regard. And in the event a third joins us, then we will take role and formally or formally recognize them as meeting as a body. Does that work for you, Mr. Mayor? That works for us. So at this time, uh, pursuant to section 54956 of the California Government Code, a special joint meeting for a workshop of the City Council and Planning Commission is hereby called for uh, with the advent described by our assistant city attorney uh, at 5.30 p.m. Thursday, August 19th, 2021. And if I could get a roll call for city council, please. Council Member Mendoza. Here. Council Member Meyer. Here. Council Member Rary. Here. Vice Mayor Rodriguez? Here. Mayor Bryant? Here. And seeing that we don't currently have a quorum, we will, as soon as we get one, uh, do the roll call for the Planning Commission. Uh, and before we go further, I do have another meeting that I must attend, a county meeting uh, at 7 o'clock, so should this meeting go Past that, I will turn the chair over to the vice mayor uh, to conduct the rest of the meeting. So at this time, uh, we will move into item two, uh, housing 101 regulations and upcoming legislation. This joint meeting of the city council and planning commission will focus on an overview of existing housing regulations and upcoming legislation. And Alexis Morse will provide the staff report, Alexis. Thank you very much. Allow me to share my screen. Bear with me. Can everyone see the presentation? Yes. Thank you. It, it, it's cut off. It's cut off? Yeah, um, let me just met. Yes, it's cut off. In, uh, it's the, we, the, the side. side can't be seen. Hmm. I'm very sorry about that. I'm not sure why that would be. Can you shrink it? Um, <clears throat> there we go. There you go. You had it. It was in landscape mode before. Okay. I'll pretend I know what I did to fix it, but I didn't. I just hit an arrow button. I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 so thank you. Good evening. Thank you uh, for attending our second workshop in our series of workshops related to land use laws and regulations that impact the city of Brentwood. 
Tonight is Housing 101 workshop, which will focus on an overview of the existing housing regulations in California and upcoming legislation. We are very pleased tonight to have Barbara Kautz from Goldfarb and Lippman giving the presentation. We also have representatives from the planning staff and the city attorney's office tonight to answer questions after the presentation. Before I turn it over to Barbara and um, Margaret, she would need to be promoted to a panelist. Um, before I turn it over to Barbara, I want to share some information about the slides aren't advancing, are they? Did that work? Yes. I'm so sorry. This is normally not an issue. Um, before I turn it over to Barbara, I just want to share some background information about her. Um, you met her briefly at our housing element meeting, but we didn't really get into her biography. Um, Barbara practices with Goldfarb and Littman, a real estate law firm. She practices in the areas of land use with an emphasis on housing related legislation, inclusionary housing, CEQA NEPA compliance, and affordable housing. She has over 30 years of land use experience. Immediately prior to joining Goldfarb and Littman, she was the community development director and assistant city manager for San Mateo. She has authored several books about zoning and housing and is a frequent speaker at conferences on housing related issues. We're very happy to hear her to have her here tonight. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Barbara. Just before she begins, just as a housekeeping note, since we do not have a quorum of the planning commission, at this point it would be appropriate to change the status of Commissioner Roberts and Commissioner Dolter to meeting attendees so that we are being mindful of the Brown Act requirements. And in the event another commissioner joins us, we can promote the commission to panelist status. Thank you for your help with that, Margaret. Thank you, Katie. Ms. Kopp, please go ahead. <laughs> well, thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the council and planning commissioners. Um, I'm pleased to be here again I should correct one thing. I haven't read, I haven't written books. I uh, wrote a few chapters of books, just to be clear. Um, the city has asked me to try to cover three key state housing laws that affect the actual review of specific development projects. And those three are the Housing Accountability Act, Density Bonus Law, and uh, SB 35. The Housing Accountability Act was originally passed in 1982, and there have been almost annual changes since 2017 to strengthen it. Uh, the density bonus law has also been around for many, many years, but again, since about 2017, the legislature seems to change it every year. Uh, we were doing once a legislative history and found out it had been amended 30 times. Um, and the last is SB 35, uh, which I'll get to, which uh, was originally passed in 2017. So the next slide. So this statement of intent was added in 2017 by the legislature, and it indicates that the purpose of the Housing Accountability Act uh, is, or one of the purposes, is to curb the capability of local governments to deny, reduce the density of, or make housing development projects infeasible. Um, and in fact, the legislature has continued to make amendments that make it much more difficult to disapprove uh, most housing development projects. So what's a housing development? Oh, if you go to the next slide, sorry. Um, so what's a housing uh, development project. So the projects that qualify for protection under the Housing Accountability Act are uh, projects that are residences only, uh, at least two or more residences, <clears throat> transitional and supportive housing, and mixed use projects that have at least two thirds of the square footage designated for residential use. Um, the Housing Accountability Act also has special protections for projects where at least 20% of the total units are low income, are uh, intended for low income households uh, and for emergency shelters and requires additional findings to be made to, to deny or reduce the density 
uh, of those projects, which make it very difficult to deny any affordable project. So the next slide. So what projects don't qualify for protection under the Housing Accountability Act? Um, first of all, projects that require a legislative approval, and that can include a rezoning, a general plan amendment, a specific plan amendment. So those projects are not, are not uh, entitled to the kind of protection and to most of the provisions of the Housing Accountability Act that I'll go through. Um, one single family home built by itself also uh, isn't, doesn't qualify. A project that's inconsistent with the city's objective standards, and I'll spend some time explaining what an quote, objective standard is. And of course, any non-residential developments. So when the city is looking at a project that's not a residential project, um, whether it's office, industrial, retail, uh, even schools, other non-residential developments, the Housing Accountability Act doesn't apply. And even if it does apply, uh, projects are still subject to the normal review under the California Environmental Quality Act and mitigation measures can still be imposed on them. So the next slide. So one big change that was adopted in a, in a bill called SB 330 or the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. And that bill was adopted in 2019 and became effective January 1st, 2020, is to allow developers to submit something called a preliminary application, uh, which can basically vest their rights in all the city's existing development standards. So a preliminary application is a, an application that includes all the items listed in a rather short list in the, um, in the government code. So the government code specifies exactly what has to be included in a preliminary application, which, is, which you might consider to be rather an abbreviated description of what's, in, what's intended. Um, and so if, the, if a developer or an applicant Submits all of submits all of those items, then it effectively freezes all development standards uh, and most fees as of the date that all the materials are submitted. Um, there's some limited exceptions to that: um, a fee that is necessary, for instance, to mitigate a. a traffic uh, to mitigate an impact under the, under the California Environmental Quality Act. For instance, a traffic fee that might be necessary to uh, mitigate traffic impacts can be applied. Um, if the developer proposes an increase of 20% or more in the number of units or square footage, or square footage uh, the preliminary application is no longer effective. And the developer also has to submit a, what I might call a regular application, a complete application to the city in 180 days. And they have to complete it within 90 days after the city, if the city says it's incomplete. So the preliminary application gives developers the kind of rights that used to require uh, a development agreement or vesting tentative map. And it allows the developers to to freeze these development standards by only submitting this short and rather limited application. The next slide. So under the Housing Accountability Act, only objective standards in most cases can be used to deny or to re reduce the density of a qualifying housing project. And, you know, as, as I mentioned, a project that needs a rezoning uh, or a general plan amendment obviously doesn't comply with um, objective standards and so is not covered by the Housing Accountability Act. Um, those projects are also subject to uh, the California Environmental Quality Act. So what's an example? <laughs> what's an example of an objective standard? Something that says, that uses the word shall rather than should. And so here's an example uh, I found online in one city's 
set of objective standards that the walls and fences shall be made of wood, masonry, or stone, and chain link fencing is prohibited as, as fencing. Um, if, the, if the standard said instead chain link fencing is discouraged, that would not be considered an objective standard. So this requires a lot of precision in the standards that the city adopts. Next slide. Um, if, a if a qualifying project complies with the city's objective standards, then the city can only reduce the density or deny it if it finds uh, a specific adverse impact to public health and safety that can't be mitigated. But the definition of a significant adverse impact is much is is one that is significant, quantifiable, direct and unavoidable based on written health and safety standards only that were in effect um, either on the date that the project was deemed complete or on the date a preliminary application was submitted. And there's no way to mitigate this. Now the standard needs to, this finding needs to be made only if the project is denied or if the density is reduced or if the city adopts um, a, a condition that quote, has the same effect as reducing density. For instance, if the city said that the height had to be two stories less, that would probably have the effect of reducing density. Um, and again, it's uh, additional standards need to be made to, to deny a, an affordable project, one where 20% of the total units are affordable. The next slide. So what is an objective standard? So here's the language that the legislature adopted. There's standards that presumably involve no personal or subjective judgment. They're verifiable by reference to an external benchmark that can be available to both the development applicant and a public official. Um, I guess I will say that any smart attorney can probably find some ambiguity in the in almost the most objective standard. Um, but essentially, it refers to standards like height, setbacks, a lot coverage, density, parking ratios, parking standards, and so forth. Um, it can also apply, design standards can also be objective, but they have to be quite prescriptive. They would need to say something like, you know, buildings must have a sloping roof or buildings must be constructed of, uh, of stucco or, you know, roofs can only be, be um, constructed of, you know, with certain types of roofs. Um, it, it requires standards that are far more prescriptive than cities have, have adopted in the past. The so next slide. So there was a case in Los Gatos that involved a 320 unit project. Uh, there had been a very detailed specific plan developed. And then when the uh, story polls went up, the community uh, kind of mobilized against the project, even though it only needed design review approval by that time. And the project was ultimately denied on a 3-2 vote and the developer uh, sued and the superior court said that none of the findings that the city had made to deny the project were objective. And here were the specific findings that the city had made that it didn't address, address an unmet need for senior housing. Now the project had 50 low income senior units, but the city felt it wasn't enough. But because this standard didn't explain or have a standard for how much senior housing needed to be included, the court said it wasn't an objective standard. Another standard was that it had to reflect the look and feel of the community. And the court said that didn't explain, you know, what was the look and feel of the community at the hearings on the project, various people showed different slides of what they thought the look and feel of the community was. And so the court said that standard is not objective either. So, so 
this gives you an example of how the courts might look at some city standards. Next slide. So when reviewing qualifying housing developments, those that don't need any kind of legislative approval, the city can apply conditions of approval. It could require that the design be changed. So long as it, that doesn't deny the project, reduce the density, or have the effect of reducing the density. So, so design conditions such as, you know, we want sloping roofs, um, you know, we want a different colors and materials, all those can still be applied. But again, they can't have the impact of the effect of actually reducing the density. Um, mitigation measures under the California Environmental Quality Act can be applied. And it's very difficult though, to make the health and safety finding, the specific health and safety finding, um, unless, you know, unless there's a very um, specific provision. Somebody asked me at one of these presentations, well, what would be, you know, what could work? Um, one of my clients had somebody ask, um, ask to uh, actually in, as part of a density bonus uh, application, but something that would have required the same finding to deny it. Uh, they didn't want to underground all the utilities. So we thought perhaps the health and safety finding could be made for that because, um, you know, we all know that a lot of power lines have sparked fires but the city didn't feel they could make the finding because the site was not in a high fire zone area. So it's difficult to find a standard that's related to health and safety that the project didn't comply with. Uh, next, next slide. And uh, again, so the project review of qualifying projects is that a decision to deny or reduce the density of a qualifying housing development normally has to be based on its lack of compliance with objective standards. And if the project doesn't comply with all of the city's objective standards, then it can be denied or the density can be reduced. That's fine. Um, so that pretty much covers the Housing Accountability Act. The legislature as part of SB 330 also made other, what I'd call somewhat miscellaneous changes one change is that if there is existing rental housing on a property that's occupied by lower income households or uh, that's occupied by lower income households, that housing has to be replaced by lower income housing. Um, also, also the number of units that exist has to be, have to be replaced with the same number of units. So if there's 23 units on a site, the new project has to have at least 23 units. Um, the, uh, the, lower, the lower and moderate income occupants are also entitled to quite generous relocation benefits equal to those, those that the city would need to pay if it were displacing people. So, there's, so there is a lot of protection for existing lower income households who are, um, who are displaced by new development. Another real, very significant change is that the city is not allowed to downzone or reduce the density or reduce the capacity of any site to accommodate housing unless it concurrently upzones. So this, so the city could choose to reduce the density of some sites and increase the density of other sites. But this provision is written written very broadly and also doesn't allow uh, the city to take any actions that would reduce the amount of housing that could be built on the site. So for instance, if a height limit were reduced, that would normally reduce the amount of housing that could be built. And so the city would need to um, either upzone some area or increase heights elsewhere. Next slide. Um, and then the final sort of miscellaneous change is that there is a five meeting limit on on, excuse me, on um, qualifying housing developments. And that includes any, basically any meeting run by the city. Um, it includes subcommittee meetings, it includes a continued hearing, um, it includes uh, appeal hearings, 
And as, as I said, any meeting conducted by the city, it could be an informal workshop. And so generally, um, if a planning commission is considering an action, it really should be trying to leave two hearings for the appeal body um, if, if there seems any chance that the project would be appealed. Uh, next slide. Um, now, there are some meetings that are not included. One, the five meeting limit doesn't, doesn't uh, kick in until the application is complete. So if at a very, very early stage, the city wanted to have a study session on a project uh, before the project was found to be complete, it could do that without uh, using up one of its meetings. It also doesn't apply to a project that's not consistent with objective standards and to projects, again, requiring legislative approvals like rezonings or general plan amendments. And it also doesn't apply to hearings required by uh, CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act. Okay, next slide. Okay, now I'm going to move into the density bonus statute, which allows developers to get uh, bonus units more units than they would normally be entitled to, uh, reduced parking standards, what are called incentives and concessions and waivers, and those two I'll explain later, in return primarily for affordable housing. Senior housing, is whether or not it's affordable, is entitled to a 20% density bonus. Land for affordable housing um, is entitled to a density bonus. Uh, if it meets a rather long list of uh, requirements. And student housing is also entitled to a density bonus, but usually usually the density bonus is requested for affordable housing. Next slide. So this is a little bit complicated chart, but it shows the density bonus available for what I'm calling mixed income projects, projects that are primarily market rate, but have some affordability. So a very low income project with as little as 5%, I mean, sorry, a, a project that has as little as 5% very low income units, that would be one unit in a 20 unit project, is entitled to a 20% density bonus. It can get four more units. If it has 11% very low income, it can get a 35% bonus. And if it has 15% um, very low income, it can get a 50% bonus. So a 20 unit project that has three very low income units is entitled to a 50% bonus, another 10 units, and could have 30 uh, units total. 30 units, three of which would be affordable. Um, I, I think in our experience, most developers use the very low income, uh, provide very low income units because they provide, that provides the most generous bonuses. But there are also bonuses available for lower income units, which is a combination of very low and low income, or for moderate income units, if they're ownership units. Next slide. Um, in, I think it was 20, oh, go on. I'm sorry, we have a question from Council Member Mendoza. I think she has her hand raised. Sorry. Hi, look, if we could go back to the last slide real quick. When we're talking about the units that they have to give, do they have to be, do they have to match the neighborhood or can they make less quality units for those to meet their, the requirements? Uh, it usually depends on what, uh, what the city has in its density bonus ordinance. Uh, some, you know, some communities adopt in their ordinance a provision that the units have to uh, be equivalent. Um, it's a problem. It's a problem if the units are very large, obviously. Um, so, so I think it varies from city to city. But the state law does not require the state law does not require that they be equivalent. Okay, and then can they double dip? So, for example, we have a 10% requirement in Brentwood. So, would it be the 10% plus what they have to do to, to get this bonus? Yeah, I have a slide, uh, just a couple down, kind of showing the effect of your inclusionary ordinance, your, your affordable housing ordinance. So, you can just wait on that. 
I, I show, but yes, they can double dip. But I'll explain that when we when we get to that. If that's okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next slide. So for a hundred percent affordable project, I think in 2018 or 2019, the legislature adopted very, very generous um, bonuses for a project that's 100% affordable. So all 100% affordable projects are entitled to an 80% density bonus. And if they are within a half mile of a major transit stop, which is either a, a rail stop, a ferry, you know, a, a ferry landing, or a place where uh, there, let's say two bus lines intersect uh, with with service available at 15 minute intervals during the evening peak hour, then the project is entitled to unlimited density. Plus they're entitled to either three stories or 33 feet additional height. So the legislature adopted very, very generous density bonuses for, for 100% affordable projects. Next slide. So this is a simple density bonus example, and then I'll get to the one with the um, inclusionary requirement. So if you had a project without a density bonus, you know, 100 units, they provided the 15% more very low income, they would get uh, a 50% bonus, 50 additional units, and the project with the density bonus would have 150 units, of which 135 would be market rate and 15 would be affordable. The next slide. So this is the one that shows the effect of your affordable housing uh, ordinance. So the city requires a rental project to have 5% very low income housing and 5% low income housing. And 5% very low income entitles an applicant to uh, a 20% bonus. The additional 5% low does not entitle the developer to any additional bonus because if you combine the very low income and the low income, you have 10% lower income housing, which also is entitled to a 20% bonus. So for a rental project, the developer is entitled to a 20% bonus if the developer just meets the city's requirements. Um, there's, a, there's a rule that the developer has to pick, um, has to choose the bonus from only one category so in that case, the developer could pick it from either the 5% very low income or the 10% low income, but they actually have the same bonus. It's more interesting with a for sale project. Um, that the city requires 3% very low income, 4% low and 3% moderate. So 3% very low income is doesn't reach the 5% threshold. The lower income number, three, the very low income plus low income is 7%, and that doesn't meet the 10% low income threshold. And the 3% moderate doesn't meet the 10% uh, threshold for moderate income. So a project that just meets the city's um, inclusionary requirements or affordable housing requirements for a for sale project would not be entitled to any density bonus they would need to provide more affordable units. But for the rental project, they are allowed to double dip, if you want to call it that. Um, the units that qualify for this to meet the city's affordable housing ordinance also qualify the project for a density bonus. There was a case, <coughs> there's a case called Latinos Unidos uh, Bree County of Napa, which where we were actually representing Napa Napa argued that the density bonus unit should be required to be in addition to the uh, units that the city, that the county otherwise would require, saying that otherwise, um, you know, there was no, the bonus provided no, um, no more, you know, there was no um, benefit to providing the bonus because the units would have to be provided anyway. But the court uh, interpreted the legislation to require uh, when the developer provided enough, uh, enough low-income housing, even if they were required to provide the low-income housing, 
they were entitled to the density bonus. So next, uh, next slide. Developers are also entitled to what are called incentives. They're entitled to uh, one to four, one to four incentives. Four incentives are only re are only available to 100% affordable projects, um, and then anywhere from one to three incentives for a mixed income project, depending on the percentage of affordability. Next slide. And so an incentive is defined as a modification of development standards that reduces the cost of the project in order to provide for the affordable housing. And it can only be denied by the city and the burden of proof is on the city. Um, if there's a health and safety impact that can't be mitigated, um, if, it, if what the person is asking for violates state or federal law, if it doesn't require any, if it doesn't result in any cost reductions or it doesn't provide for the affordable housing. So, so those are difficult findings to make. Um, and, and typically if cities are worried about whether or not a project actually uh, qualifies for an incentive, they'll hire an outside economics firm to determine um, if there's a cost, real cost reduction or if they actually provide for affordable housing. Next slide. Um, then there are, then developers additionally, and these are any projects that qualify for a density bonus, whether or not they actually ask for a bonus. The city can't apply any development standards that would quote, physically preclude the construction of the project with the density bonus or the incentive the project's entitled to. So for instance, if a developer is asking for a 35% or 50% density bonus, they probably need some modification of the usual development standards in order to accommodate those additional units. Maybe a reduction in setbacks, maybe an increased height, maybe increased floor area, maybe increased lot coverage. Um, the city can ask the developer to demonstrate that the project, you know, requires the um, the waivers, but there's no limit on the number of waivers that a developer can ask for, and there's no economic justification required for a waiver. So, uh, next slide. So what's so? Sometimes it's confusing uh, about what the difference is between incentives v waivers. I think of them as incentives are economic in some way, and waivers are are physically are fitting the project, fitting the development on the site physically. So, um, so incentives basically save the de the developer money so that the affordable housing can be provided. Um, and some examples I've seen recently, I mentioned about waiving some required utility undergrounding of it, some existing utility wires, uh, wires, waiving a requirement to install a six foot masonry wall. And then again, waivers are needed to allow the project to fit in the site. And, you know, with things like increased height or increased floor area ratio. Next slide. Ms. Couch, before we go on to the yeah. next slide, uh, Council Member Meyer had a question. That's fine. Please, yeah. Thank you. Um, can you clarify where design standards fit into all of this? Like the <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe maybe this this project kind of uh, this slide kind of talks about it. So, you can apply design standards. Um, you know, it, it, um, so you can. So all these objective design and zoning standards will still apply to a project, but an applicant can ask for either incentives or waivers to modify them if they qualify for a density bonus. Um, the can they use less expensive materials so that they can? Yeah. Okay. Something like less expensive materials. I'm making things up. Maybe a flat roof is less expensive than a sloping roof. Um, I don't even know if that's the case. Um, but that kind of uh, maybe a narrower street, um, 
so they could still ask so they can request they can request incentives if it saves them money and they can request um, waivers if they're saying that the design standard is preventing them from achieving the, the density they want. Um, density bonuses, though, in the parking lot. Does mean including setbacks? So, like, they could build something right up to a freeway um, because they, their land goes up to the freeway? Well, you might be able to have a health and safety standard on that one, um, but kept, let's talk about one not right next to a freeway, but they could request a waiver to go, yeah, to have a zero setback. Um, the bonus and the parking reduction have really have to be granted if the project qualifies. You know, there's, they have to provide enough affordable housing to get the density bonus. It has to be, uh, the rents have to meet state law. For parking reductions, um, some of them they're automatically qualified for. Some have to do with distance to public transit. The city has some discretion in looking at incentives and looking at waivers, um, but it's difficult, but uh, the state's set fairly strict standards for being able to deny them. We have one more raised hand. That's fine. Well, that was my question is, so what kind, like, how can we deny something if we think it doesn't fit in or we think the quality is really poor? How do, how can we deny something that doesn't fit our standards for our city? Well, the first thing is to have standards that are more, that are objective. I mean, I know a lot of cities have actually gotten grants from either, um, HCD or ABAG and are trying to convert their design standards into objective standards. Um, I think the difficulty comes if developers are asking for waivers. You know, and at that point, most design standards, I think, um, I think design standards generally don't reduce the density of a project. It just makes the project look better. So, so, but you'd have to look at each one separately and decide if you could make the findings to deny them. So maybe go on. So I'm just, I'm just going to talk very briefly about SB 35. Um, the same projects are qualifying, residential and mixed-use projects. There's very strict labor requirements. Almost, and If the project has more than 10 units, it needs to pay prevailing wage. Uh, if it has more than 75 units, it needs to uh, essentially use union labor or have a project labor agreement. There can't have been any rental housing on the site in the last 10 years. And in Brentwood, because you've met your um, your, uh, your uh, housing element requirements for moderate income housing, or above moderate income housing, the project would have to be at least 50% low income. Also, a new, a new requirement that was put in at the end of 2020 is that tribal consultation is required. The city would need to notify any tribes that are associated with the area. They can request consultation if the tribes believe that there's a, uh, you know, some cultural resource on the site, uh, unless they reach an agreement with the developer, the, the project's not eligible for SB 35. But if the project is eligible, then only objective standards can be used um, to approve the project. There's very strict timelines within either 60 days or 90 days of submittal, depending on the size of the project. The applicant needs to get a list of all objective standards that aren't complied with. Um, the city then has a total of either 90 or 180 days from submittal to review the design. Um, I have down here staff approval, although there can be um, commission or council public hearings, except that those hearings can't uh, chill chill the, the ministerial approval of the project. 
there can't be any discretionary approvals. It's supposed to be treated like a building permit. And there's no review under the California Environmental Quality Act if the project complies. So it's intended to be a streamlining process. Um, a lot of the projects that have been approved under this are 100% affordable projects that I'm aware of, but I've, I've seen some other projects also be approved under SB 35. And next slide. Um, I know that the, I, I understand that the council um, is very involved in the new state legislation. So this is not intent, this list here is not intended to be any kind of comprehensive list of all the bills before the legislature. I think there were something like 200 housing bills uh, introduced this year. These are some that I've seen on the uh, Cal Cities and other websites as being particularly important. Um, SB 8 would extend the Housing Crisis Act 2030. That's the one that that doesn't allow any down zoning. Right now it only goes to 2025. SB 9, which is probably the, the bill that's gotten the most attention, would allow anywhere from four to six units on single family lots. It was recently amended to say that if you want, uh, if you want to split your lot, uh, the owner needs to live there for at, least, for at least three years. It has to be owner occupied for at least three years, which is a fairly substantial change, but um, there's SB 9. SB 10 gives cities an option, but the city could allow to, could elect to allow 10 units on individual lots. AB 2015 requires a mid-cycle meeting with HCD if the city is not on track to meet its entire, um, its entire goals in the housing element. And because the goals are so high, uh, in this cycle, it's unlikely that any city of any size would be able to meet all its goals. And it appears to allow HCD then to require the city to become even more pro-housing and reduce controls on, on housing development. Um, can, I, can I ask a question regarding the SB10? Um, yeah. Was it SB35 that says that they could, even if the general plan um, doesn't allow that, that um, if they're going to bring in a multifamily unit, that they can put it into, and, and then that would go on to the SB10? Um, you so know, so we can on. allow it to happen, even let's say we don't adopt something like that. Doesn't that kind of SB35? eliminate that, I think it was SB 35. Um, SB 35 has a provision that says that if the zoning um, and the general, if the general plan allows more density than the zoning does, that the developer is allowed to uh, use the general plan zoning. That might be what, that might be what you're thinking. You know, often general plans have ranges. They might say, you know, on this site, um, in this area, generally our zoning will allow 10 to 30 units an acre. So some sites are allowed 10 units, some are allowed 20 units an acre, some are allowed 30. I, you know, I'm just giving that as an example. Um, SB 35 says all the unit, all the sites in the 10 to 30 um, unit per acre zone are entitled to 30 units an acre. And then the last bill I'm just mentioning is um, AB 1401, which says that there's no, cities cannot require parking within half a mile of a major transit stop. So that's, um, and so that's the, um, that's the conclusion and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I, Ms. Couch, I do have one question. Uh, what is the the definition of a major transit stop? I, I think I know what it is, but does that mean the ones that are planned uh, to be there or the ones that are currently there as well? I think, you know, I have to check because there's various, there's like multiple um, references about 
Um, it certainly includes the existing ones, but I believe that the definition they adopted also includes planned ones. But I can check on that and get, you know, uh, let you know for sure. Thank you. Yeah. Council Member Rarity. No, I, I, I forgot to take my hand down. Sorry about that. Okay, Council Member Meyer. Um, to continue on with your question, Mayor, um, when you're talking about planning, if there is a housing development that, that's on the books, that's been approved, that could, you know, break ground within a couple of years, but you're talking about a long-term goal for um, a transit uh, uh, setup, like BART, for example, that could be, it's, in, it's, it's like in the back of our minds, it might be in the long-term strategy, but not any actual real dates around that, would it still, it doesn't seem sense like that would I think there, there's a definition of planned um, sorry I didn't uh, there's a definition of planned I think that requires that it be in um, be in the MTC plan that it actually be in the plan but I can get I can get the city exactly how they define what what it means to be planned it's not like something, you know, in 30 years we're going to do this and there's no money and it's not in any plan. It's not quite that plan. Yeah. Well, if there are no more questions of staff uh, at this time, then we, I'll turn it to Margaret to open public comments for the workshop. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. At this time, the public is permitted to address the City Council on this item only. I have received zero written public comments on this item. If you wish to speak under public comment, please raise your hand using the Zoom feature and I'll call upon your name if provided and unmute you to speak. Remarks are limited to three minutes per person and your microphone will be muted after the timer has expired. While we encourage your comments, state law prevents the City Council from discussing items that are not on their meeting agenda. If appropriate, staff will follow up on them. And I have two hands raised. I have um, a Planning Commissioner Anita Roberts and Planning Commissioner David Dulter. I'll go ahead and call on Anita Roberts first. Go ahead. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you had mentioned earlier in your presentation about fees and fees being waived. Um, certain tier levels would have fees waived and I believe um, one of the examples you shared with the uh, group was something like, uh, with the exception of, let's say, um, traffic, um, something having to do with traffic. My bigger concern is we've just gotten into a place with fire and fees relative to, to that. Um, and I'm just, just need a little more clarification. Does that exclude them from paying fees relative to fire safety and protection. I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry, I put myself on mute. Um, okay. So I was talking about that in relationship to a preliminary application. Mm -hmm. So any fees that are in effect when a preliminary application is submitted would need to be paid by the applicant. So if the city already has adopted an in effect fire fees, for instance, or traffic fees or any fees, whatever, those would need to be paid by the applicant. So the, the difficulty comes if the city, let's say, is considering adopting fees and someone submits a, uh, and someone submits a preliminary application before those fees are in effect then the city could only impose the fees if they're necessary um, to mitigate a, an environmental impact. So with fire fees, that's, it's possible that they would be necessary to mitigate an environmental impact. Um, but but the, the issue is that submitting a preliminary application freezes, freezes fees unless the fees are necessary to uh, you know, to mitigate an impact. Is that clear? Yeah, it was clear until you said freezes fees. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. It freezes the fees that are in effect when the application's made. 
you know, okay. they're canting, uh, they, you, they can increase by CPI and, you know, so okay. basically, yeah, basically it freezes the, the fees in effect when the application's made. Okay. All right. Yeah. Then. Thank you very much for your response. Yeah. yeah. I'll call on David Dolter now. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of the council and Barbara. Uh, there's a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is that the city has taken positions on some of this pending legislation, and I'd be interested to know what those positions are and also what is the current status of litigation the litigation landscape that's surrounding some of these uh, issues let's see there's only uh there's only really one published case about sb 35 uh, which had to do with a berkeley project uh, and in that case the uh, Berkeley had denied the SB 35 application because of the existence uh, of a, the Berkeley shell mound. And the, uh, in that case, the court decided that the Berkeley, that, that SB 35 only protected the historical structures and the shell mound, you know, which had long since been uh, turned into a parking lot, was not a structure. But the effect of that decision has been somewhat changed by the adoption of the tribal consultation provision I mentioned. So, the, so now if that project were going to be proposed and the tribes did not agree, um, you know, the tribes believe that there was a cultural, uh, you know, a, a cultural resource there, the applicant wouldn't have been able to apply for SB 35. Anyway, um, there have been a lot, a fair number of superior court decisions, you know, which aren't considered to be precedent. Um, most of those, most of those have upheld the new laws, uh, but they, but they vary. Uh, we have a case going to the Court of Appeal, actually it's the oral arguments next Tuesday, involving the Housing Accountability Act, where the city of San Mateo uh, denied a project, uh, denied a 10 unit project saying that it didn't conform with the city objective design standards. And there's a variety of issues raised about the Housing Accountability Act. The Superior Court held in favor of the, uh, held in favor of the city, but you know, we'll, we'll see what the Court of Appeal does. Okay, what about the city's position on some of these other legislation that's pending. I know that they sent a letter to Jim Frazier. Uh, you know, what did it say? I can't answer that one. Well, I guess it's a question. I'm trying to, I'm trying to unmute. Um, we have a copy of the letter. We can uh, get the exact wording to you, but I believe it was an opposition letter. Um, recently to SB9, but I'm not familiar with there are other letters that have been distributed for any of the other bills, but I can certainly find that information for you. Yeah, if you just say email it to me, that would be fine. Um, just a comment. It, it seems to me that as cities, particularly Brentwood, since that's what we're talking about here, goes through its consistency uh, findings between its zoning ordinance and its general plan and any updates of that, we need to get pretty proactive in terms of really defining uh, as accurately and, and as detailed as possible our objective standards so that we're ready uh, when the developer comes forward with a project that we may not like and we have to have some objective standards to defend ourselves. So I think we need to be proactive on this and uh, hopefully the, uh, I'm sure the staff is aware of this as well. Uh, 
Yes, that is a component of the zoning ordinance update that the city is currently working on. So objective design standards are an important component of that. Okay. I don't see any additional hands raised. Okay, so at this time then we will close public comment. I do want to thank uh, everyone that spoke in public comments, our commissioners uh, for their input. Uh, and I, I do uh, greatly regret that uh, we were not able to get a quorum for our commission, but thank you both. Um, are there any additional comments or discussion from council uh, at this time regarding what we've heard tonight? Uh, council member Mendoza. Yeah, I think just a couple of takeaways is for us to understand exactly what our affordable housing guidelines are. My understanding is we demand same for same on affordable housing. So it needs to fit the neighborhood unless I'm wrong. So I think we probably need some clarification on that. And yeah, like Mr. Dolcher said, we probably need to be very um, tick and tied on what our design standards are. So um, maybe as a council and as a planning commission, we can get an update on all of that information as well, or do we need to update it? Stop, that's it. Let me, um, uh, Council Member Meyer. Um, I, I just wanted to agree with Council Member Mendoza and Commissioner Dolter. I think um, very good comment initiated by Commissioner Dolter. I think not only do we need to just keep our eyes on these objective standards and update them as necessary. I think we need to be very strategic in the way we approach them in looking at these bills and designing our objective standards to meet the requirements of um, whatever it is we need to decide to do down the road. It's just a very more, a more strategic lens, if you will. Agreed completely. Um, any, any other council input? I, I do completely agree. Uh, I have real concerns and have for a long time, uh, especially since the passage of SB3 or SB335, that um, we could potentially uh, have some real difficulties depending upon what the definition of uh, the major transit is. We've got glideways that's uh, looking. I know that may be a ways off. Uh, but, but we also have potential BART planning here as well. Uh, what that means and what it appears to mean with all of this new uh, legislation is that we would significantly be losing much local control. And when I hear words like uh, unlimited density bonuses, that really makes me very uncomfortable because you know, most of us have seen what that looks like in the Bay Area. Uh, when someone gets unlimited density bonuses, that can often turn uh, into a very uh, poorly executed project. And you know, if, if there's not good management and there's not good guidelines, uh, we, we could be looking at something that we have very little control of. So I completely agree uh, with what all of you have said. Um, I do wanna thank uh, Barbara and staff for this really helpful presentation. Uh, Council Member Rary. Uh, you know, I would have to agree with you, Mayor, on that last comment. It's, it will be very important for us to, to really look at, look at our zoning update and, and tighten it up, um, make sure that we are very accurate about what is acceptable and what the parameters are um, I, I am a little concerned um, with some of the things I've heard regarding the zoning update. So um, I, I'm hoping that it doesn't change too much uh, other than to update the, the, the current laws. I mean, things that we have to do. Um, but I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges we have is is buttoning it down um, when that zoning update comes back to us to make sure that we will have the type of city that we want and developers don't have these huge 
loopholes to use against us and build huge density uh, bonuses onto their property. And um, it's it's going to be it's going to be an interesting meeting. I think that meeting is going to be a very long one. We've had a few of those, but I'm looking forward to it. Council Member Meyer. Uh, thank you. And I wanted to, this actually is not about these laws specifically, but it's a request, Alexis, for um, city staff to really promote and share this video once it's um, available to the public. I know that this, there's not really a time frame that's very easy for the public to all jump in. I know, you know, dinner time and getting kids ready for school and bedtime and commutes and all that. So it's understandably, we haven't got a huge amount of people on, but I would really like to see us promote this on all of our social, social channels and, and our website and the newsletter potentially sending a link out to this recording. I see that we have a representative from the press on and I'm hoping that there's a, um, an article that helps to reflect all the little components that it is. I know there's so many questions about development and housing from the public, and this, this would have been a great chance for them to ask questions and make statements, but again, it, it's hard to arrange the timing for this. So I, I just really want to request that we do our best to make sure this goes out to as many people as possible to help them understand how development works on a local level and also um, based on state mandate. Thank you. Thank you. Well, if there's no further uh, conversation or questions or comments, again, thank you, um, Barbara and, uh, and staff. This was very, very helpful information. I really want to echo what Council Member Meyer said as well. This is information that I would love for all the community to have easy access to. Um, it's going to be very helpful and, and key in our decision making uh, in the future. Uh, so at this time, uh, I need a motion. Uh, for adjournment. So, so moved. Second. We have a first and a second. And a roll call vote, please. Council Member Mendoza? Yes. Council Member Meyer? Yes. Council Member Rary? Aye. Vice Mayor Rodriguez? Aye. Mayor Bryant? Aye. Motion carries unanimous. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.